I was inspired to make this video due to my long-standing appreciation for the thoroughbred horse and desire to spread awareness of their great qualities and contributions to the sport, both past and present, for this and future generations to come. Although Hilda Gurney's Keen, for one, is an incredible example of a thoroughbred in the dressage sport, this video is dedicated only to the jumping sports. While we would have loved to document the entire list of great thoroughbreds who contributed to all the disciplines, we've had to leave out many of them due to time constraints. In this video, pedigrees are not discussed at great length, but we recommend the following sources that examine bloodlines in depth. The work of Dr. Peter Birdsall is invaluable for anyone interested in jumping bloodlines. This includes his three-volume, Bloodlines of Hunters and Jumpers in North America. Dr. Daniel Marks is producing, in my opinion, the most extraordinary compilation of educational resources in the world, available soon on his website, equimechanics.com. A partial list of his work include Notes for the Breeder, Confirmation, Jumping Mechanics, Historic Jumping Review, and Veterinary Advice. A quote from Denny Emerson, a venting gold medalist. While some of the top Olympic athletes may not be full thoroughbreds, it is almost always a fact that they have thoroughbred ancestors. So, the thoroughbred, either full or in part, is the fountainhead from which most athletic horses descend, and that is not likely to change in the foreseeable future. Here's a quote from Jimmy Wofford, master historian and eventing gold medalist. The thoroughbred horse goes way back in the eventing world. Due to the demanding nature of the sport, thoroughbreds were the chosen breed and became the mainstay of the U.S. team from 1948 to 1960. From the 1960s on, there were both thoroughbreds and thoroughbred crosses, such as the famous grasshopper. A thoroughbred Irish cross and the exceptional bull minstrel, the son of a thoroughbred stallion and half-bred mare. Today, thoroughbred blood dominates many of the best warm blood eventers. Looking way back, here's one of our early thoroughbred Olympic medal winning athletes. Berlin Olympic Games, 1936. The first water introduced in the Olympic Games deep water, as you can see, and horses weren't used to jumping water. Speed seemed to be their strategy. The faster you go, the harder you fall. Captain Thompson, USA. Only 15 of the 48 horses negotiated this obstacle with no difficulty. 28 horses fell, and three refused to jump at all. Let's take a look at some of the great thoroughbred event horses over the last few decades. Ed Coffin of the United States. Watch. Well, this lovely mare, it's an 11-year-old mare by Cormac. Uh, Ballet Corps has just been given to the team by Harden Crawford and Dr. Charles Reed. Look at those ears. That's oh, a very she's alert. A, mm. She's a marvelous mare. She's by a great jumping stallion, and she really looks to be going very, very well, very freely today for a mare who's gone over this grueling cross-country the day before. She's not taking much liberty with the offensive, I'm happy to see. Flirted with the water, but I think she's all right there. Ooh. A little rattle of that behind. Stayed in the cup, good. There 
very, very <laughs> handy. One more fence to go. And she's over that thoroughly. Tad has done what he had to do in Valley Core form. What a eight. performance by a 21-year-old. First time in the Olympics. Number two in the standings. He's a member of the number one team at this point in the final event of the three days. Well within the time allowed, uh, judging from the score on the monitor, so that looks like a fair, uh, fair round. And that is going to put some kind of a squeeze on Carl Schultz riding last for Germany. He's bred to gallop, and that's more natural to him than anything else. Nicely, isn't it? Big draw. Yeah. It looks like he's been going all day. He bounces the Normandy where most horses put a stride. Somehow I knew I was going out on course to really have a good ride, to really have a good time, and, and I think the horse really liked it. United States of America with Molokai. Here's a quote from Ronnie Beard, renowned trainer, coach, and judge. The dwindling number of thoroughbreds in the sport today is not due to the failing of the thoroughbred, but in part our lack of producing horsemen with the ability and desire to discover and produce them. Prior to the mid-1980s, the hunter divisions were dominated by one great thoroughbred after the other. Some were off-track thoroughbreds, some never raced, and others were bred specifically for the ring. Although some of the long galloping courses with unrelated distances back in the day particularly suited the thoroughbreds, they were just as successful in the small indoor rings of the fall circuit, Harrisburg, Washington, and New York. Jumps in the outdoor venues were quite tall and straight, and some with minimal or no grounds. Green horses, or first year green as we knew it, started at three foot six and in the working divisions we saw heights at four foot and higher in the classics. The thoroughbred horses you're about to see are showing in a first year class at Fairfield, Connecticut. One horse, Nergo, raced until he was 12 with almost 50 wins and started his show career here at 16 years old. This is me showing hunters on the outside course at Fairfield Hunt Club, Connecticut in the late 60s. Big, beautiful galloping course without related distances and with quite different fence construction than we see today. Upright gates and fences with minimal or no ground lines were quite typical. Thoroughbred horses ruled the roost. It was about 15 to 20 years before the warm blood started to appear in mass. This is a first year green class at three foot six. This is basically the height we started our young hunters at.
Showing hunters in places like Ox Ridge and Fairfield really got me hooked on riding hunters. Too much fun. The 70s brought us some very impressive working hunter classics. Most of these were held on beautiful big grass fields like Ox Ridge, Fairfield, Lake Placid, Cleveland, and Upperville. These large venues really showed off the thoroughbred's ability to gallop and jump, what's known as brilliance. The jumps were not only well designed, but big, wide, filled in obstacles with an average height of four foot three. There were triple combinations, walls, banks, even Liverpools. The following video is a typical working hunter classic of the 70s at the Chagrin Valley Horse Show in Ohio, narrated by Ronnie Beard. Here's another great working hunter that Bernie Traurig rode in the 1970s, a thoroughbred by the name of Circuit Breaker. Bernie was very privileged that he had four great horses in the working hunter division at that time. He had Royal Blue, Circuit Breaker, Riot Free, and the very famous Gozi. All thoroughbreds and all wonderful jumpers and on any given day could win anywhere. You'll rarely see a wide ground line or a ramp type jump, which I think truly brought out the great jumping ability of these thoroughbred horses. Notice this horse and the way he jumps. He spends a lot of time in the air and he is a very expressive jumper, very bold. And I think that he covers the ground very nicely, shows a lot of brilliance. And these working classes and these hunter classics, the brilliance was given a bonus point for sure. Once again, jumping all the naturals, including just now the Liverpool very easily and going on to win this class. During the 1970s, it was very traditional that the working hunters would jump a very solid four foot. For the hunter classics, such as this one in Chagrin, the jumps were generally four foot three to four foot six with very wide spreads. I, I find that the jumps were quite a bit larger then than they are now. I have been told by of quite a few experts, including George Morris, that he would have been very happy to have taken one of these hunters and gone right to Europe and shown it in a jumper class. Here's a quote from Dr. Daniel Marks, United States equestrian team vet for 24 years, show jumping Hall of Fame inductee and horseman extraordinaire. Most of the great North American jumpers before 1980 were thoroughbreds, and many would be excellent today. In the 90s, many horsemen, myself included, thought that in general, thoroughbreds were the best show jumpers. In the early part of the 20th century, thoroughbreds were already setting high jump records. Here we see Heather Bloom, a Canadian thoroughbred jumping eight foot three with Dick Donnelly, and Wasso and Captain Alberto Laragibel of Chile jumping eight foot one in 1949. Thoroughbreds were making their mark around the world. In Italy, Raimondo Denzeo won the individual gold in Rome 1960 on the thoroughbred Posilipo. Jimmy Day on the Great Canadian Club was a member of Canada's gold medal team in Mexico City, 1968. In America, 1955, our new Hungarian chef de keep of the United States equestrian team, Bert Denemethy, wasted no time figuring out the qualities he wanted in his team horses for his extraordinary group of riders. The thoroughbred was his favorite, and the number of phenomenal athletes he acquired was amazing. Bert wanted horses that were brave, powerful, careful, and adjustable with a stable brain, blood, and stamina, and that is exactly what he got. Along with these wonderful attributes, he developed in his riders the American style, a forward seat that particularly suited the thoroughbred. Bert's success and results as coach of the USCT is unparalleled. The following films reflect not only the wonderful qualities of the horses he chose and trained, but the style he stamped in his riders. 
This was the 1959 Pan Am Games. This was myself on Night Owl. And you'll see we rode with quite a short rein. Our upper bodies well forward, which put our weight in our heels. A very classic Caprilli style of riding. Now we go to Bill Steinkraus on Revere Wonder, who was the poster boy horse of the Bot in the Wheat Line. Later, Jim Twist represented the Bon Nui line, the great French line, gray stallion of Liz Whitney Tippett's years ago of Langolan Farm. You'll see what a beautiful thoroughbred horse this is. He had a particularly cute face, lot big lop ears, beautiful eyes, dishy face, very much a blood horse. And then you get to the good part, which is how he jumps the jumps. An incredible jumping mechanism, much like a more current Jim Twist, who was his relative. This is myself, George Morris, riding the fabulous thoroughbred Sinjin. And you'll see uh, he was very quick horse. He was about 15, three and a half but had enough scope for this Olympic Games. You'll see what a lovely, careful horse he was. Here's a wonderful trail guide, old army horse with Frank Chapeau. We're back in the Olympic Stadium in the nation's cup competition. You'll see uh, even in those days, even Frank Chapeau rode in a very forward seat with a short rein. This is a remarkable horse. He's an older horse. He was an iconic animal. There uh, I am on Sinjan, the lovely American thoroughbred that Harry Delaire loaned me. He'd be a very valuable horse today, very careful, very, very rideable, very fast. Here I am, a night owl. This was the horse that I won the Grand Prix of Akhenaten in 1960. Also a thoroughbred horse by Bon Nui. We had lots of grazes, Riviera Wonder with Bill Steinkraus. That, that birch wall, that, that wood wall didn't look big, but it was about a meter 80. There's Billy on the Canadian thoroughbred Zardes Pre. You can see how hot these horses were. Even Zardes Pre was a thoroughbred horse and pretty ready, pretty up. He could this, he can hand canter these jumps. Zardes Pre could walk seven foot six. He was a puissant specialist. And there's the American flag. We had lots of victories in those days. This is the closing ceremony at Aachen, and it's exactly the same day. Look at the people. You know, several years ago, Ludger Beerbaum said, Look at the look at the public here in Aachen. Look at the I said, we, in those days, we had more public because there wasn't television. This is the iconic Dublin horseshoe at the RDS. This is myself on the great Bon Nui Sun Night Owl. Beautiful thoroughbred horse, 17 hands, immense scope. This horse won the Grand Prix of Aachen as well as innumerable puissance classes. This horse jumps 2 meters 25, almost 7 foot 6 in London the week before. This was the thoroughbred horse of Mrs. Barney's master, William. He came from Seattle area, Washington State. Beautiful. He was also over 17 hands. Again, very, very big scope. I started this horse out in the Olympic trials in 1956, and they took him to Europe, but I wasn't ready to go to Europe, so I didn't go. 
I have a very fine recollection because I made him and uh, he had an immense scope, immense heart. He wasn't very adjustable in that he didn't have a very good front end. So you couldn't get very deep defenses. Here's uh, Bill Steinkraus on Zara Esprit. You'll see the beautiful style of the horses, the riders, the position of the riders, the effortlessness of the forward seat, where you still see it today in some of the great riders. But as far as horse and rider, consistently turned out. Kathy Kuzner is one of the most unique and talented persons I have ever known. Extraordinary rider of jumpers and member of the Show Jumping Hall of Fame, first female licensed jockey and first woman to ride in the Maryland Hunt Cup, the most difficult timber race in the world. Kathy met Benny O'Mara when he was about to explode into the show world. This became a great partnership. Benny bought an 11-year-old thoroughbred hunter whom he aptly named Untouchable. He was a great jumper and with Kathy they won and won and here they show the obvious reasons why. Aberali is one of the most beautiful jumpers I have ever seen. Kathy acquired him with the reputation of being a stopper, but with her training, this issue was resolved and he never stopped again. Bill Steinkraus is the epitome of the American style. Although his training was focused on attaining perfection, his competition ride focused on winning and getting the job done in the best way. And nothing more exemplifies this than his ride winning the individual gold in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City over the biggest track ever built in Olympic Games. This round basically was a survival test. Fence one at five feet almost seems like a freebie in comparison to the others. Fence two, a slightly ramped oxer at five foot three inches tall and six foot three wide. Big wall off the turn set at five foot nine. A large triple bar, five foot six high and seven foot three inches wide. Now, off the short turn and into the rail, the huge oxer, five foot nine in front, six foot behind, by seven foot three wide. And finally, a double of a five foot three wall, two strides to an offset oxer, five foot five in the front, and five foot three behind by six foot three wide. This was a day horse and rider gave their very best. What a statement of heart and courage from this little horse and the confidence a great rider can instill in their partner. Bill Steinkraus and Snowbound, one very special and well-deserved gold medal. Joe Farges is one of the most classical examples of a forward seat rider I know, which really suited this little sensitive mare. My guess is if Caprilli were alive, he would say of Joe, yes, that is exactly right. This is phenomenal. Look at that little mare. 
She's not only short in stature, she's a very delicate little animal. Look at those legs and head and neck, and she's very curious about her surroundings. She looks yes. like she's eager to go. And the question is not anymore, is such a class a big enough horse or a good enough horse to compete in the Olympics? The question now about this horse is all-time caliber, how good is she? In fact, that she's a mare has got to make her worth an absolute fortune, since most of these competitors at this level are geldings and obviously can't reproduce. Um, she's got to be worth an incredible amount of money. Now, at this particular stage, now by the record, she is going to be the most successful horse in the United States show jumping history. That mm -hmm. covers an awful lot of great horses and great riders. Yeah, she she was part of a gold medal winning effort in the uh, in the team, and she will win a gold or a silver here in the individual. A good rub there, but she's very fast over that. Now Conrad looking on with Frank Chapeau and George Morris. And this little mare, at one point, uh, after her unsuccessful racing career, they thought of making her a steeple chaser, but she was uh, a little too difficult to handle for that, so she's in the show ring. Well, she certainly doesn't seem nervous at this. Well, she does love this. That's for sure. Now, she's going to rub a lot of jumps, but she will not tear too many of them down. She's a little bit comfortable with feeling where she is. Hind rub there, and a pretty good hind rub. She's allowed to knock one down, and she can still win. Yes, she can. But I don't think he wants her to do that. Not turning now to the final two jumps. If he can jump one of these clean, he's the gold medalist. That's the one. Olympic gold for Joe Fargus and such a flies. Unbelievable. Uh, gold she, and silver. I think she knew she won. She put the ears forward and the uh, stands erupt. They don't cheer much louder for the Santa Anita Derby here. Now we touch upon some horses that are very dear to my heart. These are not only three exceptional jumpers, but three that I've had a very personal relationship with. Sloopy was really an exciting purchase for us from the Belmont Horses of Racing Age sale as a three-year-old. In his first day free jumping, we knew we had something very special as he was unencumbered by gravity. A horse with buckets of scope. A few months later, Rodney Jenkins took over the reins and in the late spring, after only his fifth horse show, he won the Oak Brook Grand Prix as a four-year-old. Purchased by the Butlers and ridden by Neil Shapiro, he went on to win the Grand Prix of Aachen and won the individual bronze medal in the 1972 Munich Olympic Games. Jet Run was another horse of unusual scope whose amazing athletic ability was revealed at a very young age. Jet was an extremely economical jumper, folding his legs and just doing enough not to touch the fence, but with a great degree of carefulness. Jet Run, owned by Winter Place Farm and managed by Ronnie Beard, is shown here by me, Bernie Traurig, at the Gold Cup in Pennsylvania in 1974 as a six-year-old. Riding him was one of the most thrilling highlights of my equestrian career. During the three months I rode him, he won the big jump at Harrisburg in an electrifying jump off with idle dice, was second in the President's Cup in Washington, and won the Grand Prix of New York. That ended my short career with him as every international rider on the fall circuit wanted him. Fernando Senderos drew the lucky straw and went on to win the gold medal the following year in the Pan Am Games. When Fernando retired, he sold the horse to Fitz Eugene Dixon, and Michael Matz got the ride. In addition to a slew of Grand Prix wins with Michael, he won the individual and team gold at the Pan Am Games in 1979 and the World Cup Finals in 1981 in Birmingham, England. Jet Run was inducted into the Show Jumping Hall of Fame in 1996. In those days, it wasn't unusual to encounter wide oxer-oxer one-stride combinations with long distances in between, for example, 26 or 27 feet. In this class, there were two oxer-oxer one-stride combinations, one being part of a triple. Idle Dice. We purchased Idle Dice, or Oki as we called him, through Danny Lenahan as a four-year-old just months off the track. I trained and showed him successfully as a hunter during the first eight months of his five-year-old year in both the first-year green and working hunter divisions. 
He finally caught the attention of Rodney Jenkins, and the rest is history. Harry Gill purchased him, and with Rodney as his principal rider, Idle Dice had 31 Grand Prix victories. His last three were when he was 21 years old. He had no lameness problems and retired due to heaves and asthma-like condition. Up to his retirement, they were the winningest pair in U.S. jumping history. Here we see Idle Dice winning the Cleveland Grand Prix in 1977, home of North America's first Grand Prix for civilian amateur and professional riders. Although Idle Dice was a Grand Prix specialist, he was one of the most versatile horses ever born. He won numerous Puissance classes jumping over seven feet and many speed classes as well. And the amazing thing is there were times he would win all three at the same show. Now that's versatility. There have been so many famous thoroughbred jumpers in the past. Let's take a minute to look at just a few of the greats. Now we take a look at one of the greatest thoroughbred jumping lines, Bon Wee, a thoroughbred who arguably was the best U.S. jumping sire. His progeny were super careful with an ideal jumping style. Jem Twist, the outstanding jumper of his generation and many think the best of all time. He and Riviera Wonder were the best of this bloodline. They are the epitome of the French Grey bloodline who descend from Los Sancy. One look at his performance record tells you that this is no ordinary athlete. Jem Twist has amassed more than 40 career victories with total earnings in excess of $750,000. What is it about Jem Twist that makes him so extraordinary? For openers, he's a great grandson of the immortal foundation sire Bon Nui. Most of them were gray and most of them hated to hit fences and they could jump big fences. So he's very interesting from the point of view of his background and he's a throwback to this Bon Nui. Good Twist, the sire of Jem, was a small but unbelievably talented show jumper. Jim Twist is truly the horse of the century, not only in the United States of America, but you could consider him worldwide. There are so many accolades you could say about the horse. I've always felt that the test of a truly great horse is one that has not been great with one rider, but that's been great with many riders. He's proven that no matter what the rider or the type of ride, he's just a great horse. I wish everyone could just feel how he feels just once because it's very light, bouncy. Um, it's really, really a neat feeling. It's, it's not like anything else. Gem Twist has exhibited all of the greatest qualities that a horse person, a jumper, uh, requires. Courage, heart, stamina, athleticism, power, and maybe equally as important, a striking personality. Michael Golden, the only owner Gem has ever known, counts the honor of being named best in the world among the greatest his horse has won. Jem's performance during the World Championship was thrilling, ending, uh, putting he and Greg in the number one position. By pure coincidence, I sat next to the Bradleys, who were the owners of Milton, and as Jem was announced as the best horse in the world, she gave me a hug, he shook my hand, we were all excited, we had seen an extraordinary performance by a wonderful gray horse, uh, I couldn't help but not only be excited for myself and the United States, but I was particularly happy for Frank Chapeau, trainer, coach, manager of what's turned out to be one of the most wonderful horses that the United States and the world has ever seen. I don't think we'll ever have the pleasure of seeing a horse 
of his greatness again. But hold on, there's more. George made this statement when the notion of cloning was only a futuristic concept. Currently, there are two stallion clones of Gem Twist who will hopefully continue this great thoroughbred line. Gemini, owned by the Chapeaus, and Merca's Gem in England with Peter Charles and owner Olga White, founder of Team Merca. Olga said, It is absolutely unbelievable that we have a perfectly entire clone of Gem Twist, recognized by many as the greatest show jumper to have lived and competed. For my rider Peter Charles, this is a dream come true. A few years ago, we would not have even dreamed. Thanks to Frank and Mary Chapeau and the assistance of Eric Palmer from Cryo Zootec, it is now a reality. We hope this video will serve as a reminder that some of our most outstanding and beloved equine athletes of all time were proudly thoroughbreds. Not only should we remember their profound influence, but applaud and encourage their re-emergence into the mainstream of the equestrian sport.